um, I am, um, in many ways, as a husband, I wear different hats at our house. Um, in one way, I'm the chief accounting person there. I pay all the bills and all that sort of stuff. A lot of you guys can maybe relate to that, some of you women. Um, I'm also the janitor of the house. In fact, I would refer to myself as a completely domesticated husband, and I'm fine with that. I can cook, clean, do laundry, and all that sort of stuff. Which, by the way, if you're a dude and you're like, I think that's women's work, you should try it and just see how your wife responds to you if you'll do what you call women's work. It might go really, really well for you. I'm just saying. Um, But another thing that I do as a husband um, is I do all the grocery shopping, and that's because my work week is Sunday through Thursday. My wife's work week is Monday through Friday, so I have Friday off, so I do the grocery shopping then. Um, In theory, that's an awesome idea. In practice, that can tend to blow our budget because I have a very hard time staying within budget because I'll, I'll do really good, like walking past the fruits and vegetables and all that sort of stuff, but when I I get to the ice cream aisle or the dessert aisle. I'll just be pushing my cart and I'll be like, whoa! And then my eyes will fall on something beautiful. In fact, this week it was ice cream cake ice cream. And I was like, should I buy it? Yes, I'll buy it. Because uh, I, just, I just have a sweet tooth. That's like my downfall. And this will cause me to spend money that I probably shouldn't spend at times. So last year around my birthday, I was here at Walmart here in Smithfield. And I don't even remember what I was going in the store for, but it was supposed to be a quick in and out sort of thing. And so I'm walking in, I got my head down, and there's this little cooler right near the, the bakery section. And my eyes caught something. And it was like the Spirit of God turned my head this way. And my eyes fell on Ultimate Red Velvet Cheesecake from the Cheesecake Factory. Now, and and I haven't used a cheesecake illustration in a while, so for those of you that are new, I love cheesecake. It's a part of my personality. It is not going away. Um, And so my eyes fell on this thing, and it was more than I wanted to spend, and I hadn't planned on spending that money in there this morning. Um, So immediately this mental battle ensues in my mind. It's like, should I buy it? No, I wasn't planning on spending money, and you have a budget to stick to. And then the other side of my brain was, cheesecake is awesome, which I was like, amen, I agree with that. And then the other side of my brain was it's also your birthday month so I was like dang it I'm buying cheesecake because it's my birthday and I can justify it even though it caused me to spend more money than I initially intended to that particular day here's the point in that we will spend more money than we will typically spend or we'll pay a cost that is higher than we would maybe normally pay if it's something that we value you would pay a cost for something you value even if it's more than you would normally spend because for some things let's be honest you can't put a price tag on. So, for example, how much would you pay if there was a cost to be paid for it to have every single morning when you woke up a sense of purpose? And what would you pay in order to wake up every single day with a sense of hope even when circumstances in your life felt hopeless? What would you be willing to pay for to be able to wake up in the morning and you have joy even when there's no joy really in your circumstances? What would you be willing to pay to constantly have a sense of satisfaction and contentment even when nothing in your life feels very satisfying? And I think all of us would agree on some level that, hey, regardless of my church background, whether you've been in church all your life or you're just checking out church, and if that's you, we're glad you're here, all of us would agree on some level that if there was a cost to be paid for those particular things, we would be willing to pay that cost. Because after all, who doesn't want a constant sense of purpose? And who doesn't want hope? And who doesn't want joy? And who doesn't want peace? And who doesn't want satisfaction? And so I think all of us would say, I would pay for those things. So here's the good news in that. Those are the very things that Jesus offers when he offers you and I eternal life. See, eternal life is way more about going to heaven when you die. And by the way, let me just clear up a misconception about heaven. Heaven is not when we die, we go, we float on clouds, we're chubby, naked little babies with wings, and we play harps. That is not what you find out about heaven in the Bible. Heaven is going to be a celebration for all of eternity as we enjoy God's presence in a place where there's no more suffering, no more pain, no more shame, and constant joy and satisfaction. But that's but there's so much more to just go to heaven when you die. It's you in this life, as soon as you become a follower of Jesus, he fills you with a sense of purpose. He fills you with a sense of joy. He fills you with hope and peace like nothing the world can ever offer. He gives you satisfaction and contentment because at the end of the day, the only way we can really truly be satisfied is to step 
into a relationship with Jesus. That's what Jesus is offering. Peace, joy, hope, purpose, satisfaction, contentment when he says, I'm offering you eternal life. It's more than just go to heaven when you die, although admittedly, that's an awesome benefit. It's about life that you get to experience right here and right now in the present, not just when you die. And I believe that regardless of what you think about Jesus, you and I could agree that we would all love hope. We would all love joy. We would all love purpose and peace. We would all love the things that we get from eternal life. And so with that in mind, I want to introduce you to a young man who was seeking eternal life here in Mark chapter 10. We start off on verse 17. As Jesus started on his way, a man ran up to him and fell on his knees before him. That will be really important in just one second. Good teacher, he asked. What must I do to inherit eternal life? Now, the picture we give this young man is that he's desperate to know the answer to this question. And you might say, well, why is that? Because he does two things that Jewish men did not do in that day and time. He ran to Jesus, and then he fell on his knees. This was considered very, very undignified. And the fact that he did those things indicated he was desperate, and he was specifically desperate to know the answer to the question he asked. What must I do to inherit eternal eternal life. In fact, the picture that really comes to my mind, this picture of I'll do anything to get this thing I'm looking for, is honestly of a guy when he's first dating a girl. And see, some of you ladies who are married, you remember the guy that your husband was when you were dating because he shaved, he actually smelled nice, he put on deodorant, he wore nice clothes, he spent money on these things called dates and gifts. Do you feel how uncomfortable it's getting in the house right now? Because some of you ladies are like, My husband hadn't done that since we were married. Which, by the way, that's another issue for another time, but shameless plug. The Sunday after Labor Day, we're starting a marriage series. So I would encourage you to mark that on your calendars. That is going to be a lot of fun. It's going to be called Man versus Wife, and it's going to be fun. So shameless plug on that. But the point, getting back to our story here, this guy is desperate to know, what do I have to do to have eternal life? And I think the way Jesus responds is very, very interesting. He says this, why do you call me good? Jesus answered. No one is good except God alone. Now, to me, that's, that's a rather abrupt, kind of odd answer because it doesn't really answer the question. It, it almost carries the tone of this. Okay, you're saying you would do anything for eternal life, but are you really sure about that? Because it doesn't really answer the question. It's almost like a pushback from Jesus, and I believe the reason he pushes back on this young man, and I believe the reason he would push back on some of us who would say, I will do anything to have eternal life, to have hope, joy, peace, purpose, and satisfaction. I think he pushes back with a tone of, will you really? Because reality is this, if we're truly serious about that statement, if we're truly serious about, I will do anything to gain eternal life, I would do anything to experience joy, peace, hope, and purpose, then that's going to force us to wrestle with a very uncomfortable reality, and it's this right here. If God alone is good, and this is what Jesus just said, God alone is good, then that means by extension, We are not good. Why? Because we're not God. If God alone is good, then by definition, you are not God, I'm not God, then we are not good. Therefore, because we're not good, this isn't on the screen, but it's important to point out, since we're not good, we don't know what is good. We can't look within ourselves or examine our heart or follow our heart to find what is good. Only somebody who is good, in this case, God, can lead us to what is good. Therefore, if we want what is good, We must listen to him even if we don't like what he says. And that is what so many times will trip us up. Because I can promise you this, I can promise you this. The closer and closer you get to Jesus, the more and more he will tell you things that you really don't want to hear. But, If you're serious about, well, I would do anything for eternal life. I want the type of hope you're talking about. I want the type of peace and purpose and joy and contentment that you're talking about. Then at the end of the day, you have to have a posture of, regardless of what God says, even if I don't like it, I'm going to listen to it and I'm going to to obey it. So with that in mind, and I don't do this very often in the context of of in the middle of a message, but I want us to just pray for a second as we kick off this series skeptical and just ask that God would help us to listen 
to what he says to us and then actually to follow it. So let's pray real quick. Father, thank you so much for this day and the chance we have to come here together and hear from your word. God, I pray that you would make us teachable, that we would humbly accept what you say to us, even if it touches areas of our lives that we don't want want touched and that are uncomfortable for us to wrestle with. But I pray, Lord, that you would touch those areas and you would give us the faith to obey you and the courage to obey you, even if we don't like what you've said. And we ask these things in your name, Jesus. Amen. Jesus continues the conversation in verse 19. He says this, You know the commandments. You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not give false testimony. You shall not defraud, honor your father and mother. Now, this is the second part. This is part two of what's called the Ten Commandments. And if you're not from a church background, the Ten Commandments, they made a, mo- a movie about it, Charlton Heston in it. It was way more awesome than the other Moses movies that have come out ever since. I'm a little old school in that fashion. But the Ten Commandments are a summary of God's law to people. And part two, which is what Jesus quoted here, is God's laws as far as how people are to interact with people. And let's be honest, it's pretty easy to measure whether or not you've lived up to this part of the law. Like, you probably don't have to wonder if you've ever murdered somebody. And if you do have to wonder about it, that's probably a, a counseling conversation where you can drop by next steps. We'll walk you through that. You don't have to wonder. You don't have to wonder if you've ever cheated on your spouse. You don't have to wonder whether you've ever lied in court unless maybe you're a politician and then the truth kind of blends in with the lies. You probably don't have to wonder about that. You don't have to wonder if you've ever defrauded somebody. You don't have to wonder if you've ever cheated your neighbor. These are things that are honestly, they're pretty easy to measure. And if I was to ask you, you're sitting in a coffee shop or something, how you thought you were doing on these things, you would probably respond the same way this young man does in verse 20, teacher, he declared, all these I have kept since I was a boy. In fact, you might even feel like this young man. You might say, you know what, when I look at my life, I'm I'm pretty confident that I've done what God wants me to do, at least as far as how I interact with other people. And many times, if that's how we measure how we are spiritually, then we can tend to think we're pretty good. But notice that Jesus left out the very first part of the Ten Commandments, which is how people are to relate to God. And that's where he turns his attention to next. But to sum up part one of the Ten Commandments, it's basically this. God is the only God. God is the only one who gets our worship. And God is in charge and he calls the shots in your life. That is part one of the Ten Commandments in a nutshell. And that is the part of the Ten Commandments that we and this young man tend to have such a difficult time dealing with. So Jesus teases us out next in verse 21 is where he starts. Jesus looked at him and loved him. And I want to pause right there because I want us to understand something really quick as as we really start to dive into this. When Jesus tells you something you don't want to hear, it's not because he's out to get you And it's not because he's trying to ruin your life and ruin your fun and rain on your parade. It's not because he's ticked off at you and is just waiting to beat you down with a hammer when he catches you doing something wrong. It's because he loves you. And because he loves you, he's going to point out things in your life that you might not want him to point out. But he'll point them out because he knows those things, if they're not checked, if they're not stepped away from they will utterly destroy your life. And so he points them out. Now, here's where that creates tension for us. We can tend to buy into the cultural idea that if you love someone, you don't tell them that they're doing something wrong. And you don't tell them they're living the wrong way. And you don't tell them they should stop doing something if it makes them happy. Because that's intolerant. And that's bigoted. And that's not very sensitive. But see, the problem with that line of thinking is it doesn't hold up in a logical situation. For example, for example, imagine, imagine that you decided that you wanted to start a diet of, of pizza and cheeseburgers and hot dogs dipped in ranch dressing. Which ranch dressing is gross, but it's very unhealthy. And I have the microphone and I needed an illustration. So imagine this is the diet that you come up with. And then you go to the doctor, and he says, what's what's your diet been? And you say, pizza, cheeseburgers, hot dogs, all dipped in ranch dressing. It's amazing. And then he said, it's not amazing because your blood pressure is at like heart attack in five minutes level. You need to stop eating pizza, cheeseburgers, and hot dogs dipped in ranch dressing, or you will have a heart attack and die, and you need to start eating kale salad, and here's some medication to lower your blood pressure. 
Here's how you would respond if you followed our cultural philosophy on how to respond when somebody tells you something you don't want to hear. You would tell the doctor, you insensitive bigot. I can't believe you would tell me that I need to stop eating cheeseburgers, pizza, and hot dogs dipped in ranch dressing. It makes me happy. I enjoy it. And it's just very, very unloving for you to tell me to stop this thing that makes me so happy. Who do you think you are? None of us would respond like that. We would be like, thank you, doc, I appreciate it, pass the kale and give me the medication. Because we would realize that by the doctor pointing that out, it's not because the doctor is trying to ruin our fun, it's because he's trying to preserve our life. And the same thing is true when Jesus points out something in your life that he says is wrong and you need to stop. It's not because he's trying to get you, it's because he loves you, and it's because he knows if you continue doing those things, they will be destructive. And so what I hope for many of you in this room is what will happen to you, the same thing that happens to this young man. And Jesus puts his finger on the main thing at the time in this young man's life that was keeping him from experiencing the eternal life that God wanted him to have. And this is where Jesus goes with it. One thing you like, he said, go sell everything you have and give it to the poor and you'll have treasure in heaven, then come follow me. Now, we need, we need to tease this out or else we'll, we'll vastly, vastly misunderstand this verse. First off, Jesus says, one thing you lack, and then he tells the guy to do four things. Go, sell everything you have to the poor, you'll have treasure in heaven, come follow me. He tells him four things. The first question that comes out of that is, well, does Jesus have a problem with math? And the answer is no, Jesus doesn't have a problem with math because Jesus was not saying the one thing you have to do to have eternal life is go do some charitable donations. And see, if, you, if you're from church world, that's probably the way you've heard this preached, that the one, that's probably the way you've heard this preached is the one thing that was keeping this man from following Jesus and having eternal life was he was greedy and he just needed to go sell everything and if he sold everything, that's how he would have eternal life. But that's not true. Jesus was not saying, hey, here's one more religious to-do list thing to check off. Go do that thing and you'll have eternal life. That's not what he's saying. Jesus is, not all, is neither making a statement about whether money is good or evil. Which, by the way, money is not evil. The love of money is a root of evil. So he's not making a statement on money. He's not saying, hey, here's one more item to check off of your religious to-do list. What he's saying is this. The one thing you lack, the one thing that's keeping you from eternal life, the one thing that's keeping you from experiencing the hope, joy, peace, purpose, and contentment that comes in a relationship with God is this. God is not your God. And God is not your source of hope. And God is not your source of joy. Your money is. Your money is what you worship. Your money is what's controlling your life. Your money is where you're placing your security. And so in order for you to actually grab onto what God wants to give you, the best thing for you to do is completely get rid of this thing that has its tentacles so deeply entwined into your life. If you even leave a little bit, this is such a big deal for you that it will pull you back. So the best thing you can do is completely get rid of it. Because once you completely get rid of this other God, then you can actually step into a relationship with God. And God can actually be your God. And God can be who you worship. And God can be where you get your hope, joy, peace, and security. Because money will no longer be an issue. In other words, Jesus is saying, in order for you to actually give God control of your life and have eternal life, then you need to completely divorce yourself from this thing that is your other God because God will not share the throne of your heart with anyone or anything. Jesus either gets all of you or he has none of you. And the way this young man responds to me might be the most tragic story in all of Scripture. Watch this. At this, the man's face fell. He went away sad because he had great wealth. Now, that's tragic for two reasons. First off, Jesus clearly laid it out to this guy and said, Hey, you want to have eternal life? Here's, here's how you respond. Walked away. But it's also tragic because, notice, 
Jesus let him walk away. Jesus didn't try to get him and say, okay, okay, okay I, was j- I was joking, you can sell three quarters of it. No, Jesus doesn't back off of his standards. Jesus says, this is what I'm calling you to do. This is how you can respond. This is the only way. Which begs the question, why did this young man walk away? I'll tell you why he walked away. Because even though he said he would do anything for eternal life, even though he looked desperate to have hope, joy, peace, and purpose, and satisfaction, like maybe many of you are, and see what's really interesting about that dynamic for this young man is he was wealthy, and he lived an otherwise good moral life from all appearances, and yet the problem with this young man was deep down inside, he knew there was something missing. He knew that he didn't have something that he needed, so he went to Jesus to find out what it was. Jesus told him what it was, and then he said, nope. And I think maybe that describes some of you this morning because your life is pretty good. Your life is pretty successful. You've got a good family. You've got a good home. You've got uh, things tend to be good. You live a pretty good moral life, but inside you know something is lacking. And I think Jesus would say, the thing that's lacking is I'm not in control of your life. And yeah, I believe every single week there are people who come here that leave saying no to what Jesus offers. And the reason they do that is for the same reason this young man walked away. They love the way they live more than they really want eternal life. Which leads me to this idea, and I hope this strikes a nerve for some of you. It's this. Disbelief in Jesus is more about our do's than our doubts. Disbelief in Jesus is more about our do's than our doubts. You say, what do you mean by that? I've heard people make this statement. I I, I just can't believe in Jesus. In fact, in fact, you might have some of the questions that were in uh, the video before the message. I don't know how to reconcile the Bible and science. I don't know how to, how to make sense of the whole resurrection idea or the virgin birth. It all seems kind of impossible. I don't know how, how to reconcile what I hear from other people. And I, don't, I don't know if I can trust the Bible. But see, here's the thing at the end of the day. It's not that you can't believe in Jesus. Because here's reality. You can believe whatever you want to believe very easily. For example, and this might get touchy, but that's okay. It'll be fun. The University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill is currently under the investigation by the NCAA. Now, 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 I'm not going to make a value judgment on this. I just want to make a point. There, depending on where you stand on Carolina, depends, will determine how you view this. For example, as a North Carolina State fan, or if you're a Duke fan, then as you look at all the evidence and all the information, you come to the inescapable conclusion that the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill, a.k.a. Carolina, they are the scum of the earth, and they are cheats, and they should have national titles and victories stripped away from them, and it would be glorious and amazing because this is who they are as a school. That's what you believe as a State fan or a Duke fan. On the other hand, if you're a Carolina fan, like our dear pastor, Mark or Lamar here, then you look at all the evidence and all the information and you're like, well, there's nothing to see here. It's all blown out of proportion. What makes the difference there? Because you can choose, to, it's, it's not a lack of information. It's not a lack of evidence. It's what you do. See, because this is what I do. I root for states, so I view the evidence one way. Mark or Lamar, they root for Carolina, so, so, so they're going to see it another way. It has nothing to do with doubts or lack of evidence or lack of information. It has everything to do with what you do, and that colors what you believe, and it is the same way with Jesus. It's not, it's not that you have a lack of information because there, there's a lot of information out there that, that looks like it backs up the claims of Jesus. It's not that there's a lack of evidence because reality is there's some incredibly smart people with alphabet soup after their name that can tell you point by point why the Bible is true, why it's trusted, why Jesus came back to life, why he's the only way, and you could not poke any holes in their Argument and, and to say otherwise that no smart people believe in Jesus is just on, it's, it's, it's intellectually dishonest. So it's not a lack of evidence and it's not a lack of information. It's, it's the fact that you know you're doing certain things, you're living a certain way, and you know that if you follow Jesus, you would have to submit that to him and let him control that and let him tell you what to do with that. And at the end of the day, you just don't want to do that. You know that there's things that you're doing that Jesus would call you to give up if you follow him. And you're like, I, I, nope, nope. And, and, and listen, listen, I'm not saying there's not legitimate questions. And I'm not saying there's not legitimate doubts. And I'm not saying there aren't legitimate skepticisms. But I believe if we strip all of that away, then in the majority of circumstances, disbelief in Jesus is not so much fueled by doubt. It's fueled by what 
we do. The bottom line is we, don't, we simply don't want to stop doing it. And what's tragically ironic about that is we come here saying we would do anything to have hope, joy, peace, purpose, satisfaction, to have eternal life, and yet Jesus lays it on the line, this is how you get it, and then we say nope, and then we go right back to the same things we were doing and think those are the things that will satisfy us. And that's tragic. Which is why Jesus responds like this, verse 23. Jesus looked around and said to his disciples, How hard it is for the rich to enter the kingdom of God. The disciples were amazed at his words. But Jesus said again, Children, how hard it is to enter the kingdom of God. It is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for someone who is rich to enter the kingdom of God. Now, what that means is this. It's hard for a rich person to enter the kingdom of God just like it is hard for a literal camel to go through the eye of a needle that a thread goes through. In other words, it is impossible. You might say, well, what does that mean? That doesn't mean that rich people can't be saved. Because I know rich people, and they're following Jesus. Again, this is not a commentary on money. Well, the bigger picture of that is this. I think you could read that verse like this. How hard it is for the self-reliant and self-sufficient to enter the kingdom of God. Because the thing we struggle with in America, we're self-reliant and we're self-sufficient. We think we can do it all. We think... We've got it all figured out. We think we'll pull ourselves up by the bootstraps and make this thing happen because, my gosh, that's what we do. And the reason it's so difficult for the self-reliant and self-sufficient to be saved, to have eternal life, is because when you're self-reliant and you're self-sufficient, which honestly is a plague for rich people, it's a plague for a lot of American people, the problem with that is you don't see how wretched and helpless and hopeless you really are. Because reality is, I don't care how much money you have, I don't care how good of a family you have, or how many kids you have, or how many cars you have, or how big your home is, or how big your retirement account is. At the end of the day, you can't do a dang thing to save yourself. Because remember, you're not good. You can't make yourself good. You can't save yourself. You can't make yourself acceptable to God. But we tend to miss that the more self-reliant, the more self-sufficient we are. We tend to think, well, no, I can make it happen. And we miss how broken we are. We miss how sinful we are. We miss how hopeless we are. And because of that, we miss the fact that we need a Savior. Not as like an add-on to our life, but as the only way to find life. I had a conversation with a family member one time, and I think this might even illuminate the minds of some of you guys here. And she said, you know what, I don't really see the need to follow Jesus because my life is pretty good. I got a good kid. I have a good husband, a good career, good house. Things are going good. But see, the thing about that is this. Following Jesus is not about adding a religious component to your life. And following Jesus is not about you somehow starting to get religious and kind of adding Jesus as a thing on the bookcase. No, no, no. Following Jesus is actually discovering that without Jesus you're dead and only in Christ do you come alive. Following Jesus is about discovering that without Christ I am hopeless. Only in Christ do I actually have hope. But as long as you are self-reliant and self-sufficient like this young man is here, you won't listen to what Jesus has to say. And instead you say, you know what, I don't buy that, so I'm going to ridiculously, if I can just be honest, go back to these same temporary things that I'm clinging to. It hasn't worked so far, but maybe if I can have one more time of pleasure, maybe if I can make another $100,000, maybe if I can get another promotion, maybe if I can have another kid, maybe if I can date somebody and actually work out, maybe that thing will satisfy me. And I can just promise you this, as long as that's your mindset, you're chasing a moving goalpost and you will never get there because only in Christ can you find the hope, satisfaction, peace, and purpose that you're so desperately looking for because apart from Christ, you get none of that. And it's harder to see that the more self-reliant and self-sufficient that we are. This young man, he was rich. He, he, he assumed that he could find that on his own. And he didn't need Jesus. And that's why Jesus made this, car, this comment, how hard it is for the rich to enter the kingdom of God. But there was a bigger 
point that Jesus was making in that, and we see that brought out here in verse 26, the disciples were even more amazed and said to each other, who then can be saved? The disciples understood that Jesus' observation here was saying, there's no one on this earth that can be saved through their own attempts and their own efforts. And that was mind-blowing to them because back then, if you were rich, you were deemed to have a leg up on the competition because in that day and time, the way you got right with God, the way you had your sins forgiven, you offered animal sacrifices. Naturally, if you were a rich person, you could pay for more animal sacrifices. So it was assumed that you were already ahead of the competition. But Jesus said, no, 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 no. The, the, the playing field is completely level here, and being rich is not a leg up. In fact, being rich and self-sufficient, that will actually be a hindrance because of your mindset. And so the disciples rightly concluded, well, then who in the world can be saved? And Jesus says this, verse 27, with man this is impossible, but not with God. All things are possible with God. Do not miss this. The only way that you can possibly be saved, the only way you can ever have hope, joy, peace, and purpose, the only way you can go to heaven instead of hell is not by trying to get religious and trying to add something to your life and trying to pursue all these temporary things. It is only in the context of a relationship with Jesus. When you do the one thing that this young man refused to do, you give him control of your life. But that's not something you achieve. You don't achieve eternal life. You don't achieve a relationship with God. It's simply something you accept. Salvation is not a thing that you can accomplish. Salvation is just something you accept from God. But see, in order to accept it, you have to have open hands, which means you have to give up control of your life. And you have to say, okay, God, you're in charge now. You call the shots, not me. And that's what trips up a lot of Southern Christianity because so much of Southern Christianity is, okay, I believe Jesus died for my sins and rose from the dead. God, get me out of hell. Y'all, that's not what it means to be saved. Being saved is not Jesus, get me out of hell so I can go live however I want. Being saved is, Jesus, I'm broken, I'm worthless, I'm completely messed up and sinful and helpless and hopeless without you. Jesus, because of that, save my life, take control of my life because if I control my life, I will drive my life straight to hell. It's only through giving Jesus control of your life that you actually find eternal life. But I don't want to sugarcoat it for you. It has a cost. In fact, Peter said this, one of Jesus' disciples, verse 28. Peter spoke up, we've left everything to follow you. In other words, uh, Jesus, we've kind of done the very thing that you kind of asked this young man to do. We've left everything. Um, what are we going to get out of this? In fact, I think that's the question some of you may have is, what am, I gonna, what am I really truly going to get out of that? And Jesus responds. Truly I tell you, Jesus replied, no one who has left home or brothers or sisters or mother or father or children or fields for me in the gospel will fail to receive a hundred times as much in this present age. Homes, brothers, sisters, mothers, children and fields. Here's what he's saying is this. When you follow Jesus, guess what? It may cost you relationships and probably, probably will. It may cost you some family ties, some family relationships. But guess what? When you step into a relationship with Christ, you get a bigger family. It's called the church. And the bonds of the church can't be broken even by death because we'll still be family in eternity. You gain something out of it. You gain something better. It'll probably cost you in terms of material things. In fact, I promise you, it will cost you. But Jesus said you'll get fields, you'll get rewards. You might say, well, what are the rewards? Here's the rewards for me. Life's changed. The heartbeat of this church is not coming here and doing this on Sunday morning, as awesome as this is. The heartbeat of this church is we get to see people who were disconnected from church and after years reconnect to church. We get to see people who were outside of a relationship with Christ be brought here by a friend who cared about them and they step into a relationship with Christ and they get baptized and they start seeing the direction God has for their life. Life's change is about seeing people who are on a path to sin but the Holy Spirit starts to work in them and convict them of sin, and they start to correct things in their life and get their life on track with God. Seeing lives change is about people moving from being spiritually dead to being spiritually alive, from being hopeless to actually having hope to being without purpose to having purpose. Y'all, that's the rewards we get as followers of Christ. And that's exciting. If seeing people's lives change does not get you excited, you're probably not following Jesus. 
Because there's nothing to me like seeing people move from being spiritually dead to being spiritually alive and actually finding the life that comes with Christ. But it has a cost because Jesus says this next. He says the other thing you get is you get persecutions. Following Jesus is not easy. Following Jesus will cost you things. I can promise you that. If you, if, if, listen, if your version of following Jesus doesn't have a cost attached to it, you're not following Jesus. And you might say, well, then why in the world would I do that? Because that, that doesn't sound like a very good decision because this is what he closes out with. He says, and in the age to come, eternal life. In other words, that thing that you want, that hope, that joy, that peace, that purpose, that satisfaction, that you want, you said, and you do anything for, guess what? You give me control of your life, that's what you get. It, it, it does have a cost with it. It will cost you everything. It will cost you control of your life. But guess what? You actually get the thing that you were looking for in the first place. But it can be easy to lose sight of that, even as a follower of Christ, because verse 31, Jesus says, but many who are first will be last and the last first. You might say, what does that mean? That means this. In this life, following Jesus does not look like winning. It looks like losing. I mean, it it doesn't look like winning to say, okay, I'm going to follow what God commands about sexuality. It doesn't look like winning to say, I'm going to actually give my money to the local church and invest in God's mission. It does not look like winning to say, you know what, I want to serve people instead of be served. It does not look like winning to say, you know what, I'm going to start confessing all my faults and all my sins and tell people how messed up I am and and then ask them to pray for me. He's like, 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 that sounds like weakness. That doesn't sound like winning. Y'all, let's just be honest. It doesn't look like winning to wake up at 5 o'clock on Sunday morning and come here and set all this up for an hour and 15 minutes together and then break it all down and do it again next week. It doesn't look like winning. That looks absurd in the eyes of the world. That looks absurd in the eyes of culture. But Jesus said this, what looks like losing in this life, when you follow Jesus, it will look like you're losing. But guess what? It's actually winning because when you step into eternity, all these, what Paul calls light and momentary troubles, will just, they'll fade away and it'll be like they didn't even exist because of what we get in eternity. And the people who look like they're winning in this life, the self-reliant, the self-sufficient, the self-dependent, those are the ones who actually end up losing because they based their hope on the things they could get in this life. And guess what? If that's all, that's, that's all you're hoping that you're going to get for eternity, that's all you'll get for eternity because you can't take any of it with you. So in eternity, you get nothing but hell and suffering. And Jesus doesn't want that for you. I don't want that for you. This church doesn't want that for you. We want you to have eternal life, but there's only one way to get that. You give Jesus control of your life. And the beautiful truth about that is this. When you give Jesus everything, you ultimately gain everything. When you give Jesus everything, you ultimately gain everything. Jim Elliott, a missionary who gave his life taking the gospel, the good news about Jesus to Ecuador and was killed for it, said two things. One of them is really well known and it was, He is no fool who gives what he cannot keep to gain that which he cannot lose. Y'all, when you give up control of your life, guess what? You gain eternal life, and you can't lose that. But he said something else that's that's a little less well-known. It's this. God always gives his best to those who leave the choice to him. And the way you leave the choice to God is you give him complete control of your life. You follow him wherever he tells you to go, do whatever he tells you to do regardless of the cost when he says hey you need to correct this in your life you listen to him and by the way one of the biggest ways you can tell if you're actually a follower of Jesus when Jesus calls you to go somewhere you do it you follow him